Hello, my name is Adam Stockholm from Long and McQuaid, and welcome to our online workshop presentation as part of our month-long band and orchestral promotion. Tonight, we welcome Karen Donnelly, who is the principal trumpet player of the National Arts Center Orchestra in Ottawa, as well as being on faculty at the University of Ottawa. Tonight's workshop is brought to you by Long and McQuaid and Yamaha Canada. And without further ado from me, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Karen Donnelly. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Karen Donnelly, and I'm the principal trumpet player of the National Arts Centre Orchestra here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. So welcome to this uh, live stream. Uh, and I thought I would start off by just playing a little piece for solo trumpet. There you go. Okay, thank you. That was uh, that was a piece for uh, solo trumpet by an American composer who's also actually an author, like a like a book author uh, and a poet. Her name is Regina Harris Biacci, and uh, she was born in Chicago in 1950. And uh, this piece was written in 1990, premiered uh, by the former principal trumpet, well, premier premiered at, at the Chicago Symphony by um, George Vosberg, who was in the section of the Chicago Symphony at that time. And um, it's kind of a cool piece. Uh, I, I really like playing it because it has this jazz influence. Um, she says in the notes that she was uh, inspired by Miles Davis and dedicated this to one of her university professors, William Butler Fielder, who was a very well-known uh, trumpet player, jazz educator. And I just want to write this because I know a lot of um, educators might be watching this at some point or, or something. So I just think this is really um, so cool that she, she wrote, wrote this. So this is quote, quoting the, the composer. 
Even though I abandoned the trumpet to concentrate on writing music and words, Prof, that's what they call them, never abandoned me. Until he passed away, he encouraged me to resume playing the trumpet. He was convinced there was a prodigy inside me longing to emerge. Prof taught me how to listen attentively, to practice intently, and love deeply. I, I don't know. I, I think that's so cool. When If you're an educator and, you know, it's it's... It's a grind, all the students year after year, and every now and then you get this one gem of this student who like, yeah, what you did for me, what you said to me resonated. So I, I think that's pretty neat that she that she wrote this about this piece. I, I, just a little trumpety note. Also a cool element about this piece is that um, it's written for either solo trumpet or duet. So if you want to have and it's indicated in the score and so if you want to play with a friend you can and the person on stage because it's uh inspired by miles davis there's some jazz um obviously jazz inspired licks in there and um the, it's a sort of a trumpet call the opening is quite powerful it's sort of like hey listen i want to say something about the trumpet players so there's some like smoothie cool licks and also sort of bebop a little bit um but the Trump, so the duet version, the person on stage is in Harmon mute, so Miles Davis mute, and then the second player is off stage. Anyway, so and anyway, so there you go. There is, I like that there's, there's that flexibility because it's always fun to to have um, to have options. So um, yeah, this is going to be a, a a little bit of me sharing a <laughs> trumpet nerd talk from my basement here in Ottawa. Um, I, and before we get started, I just want to say thanks to Long and McQuaid for the invite. Um, I mean, I'm honored. It's a privilege, a pleasure. I, I mean, I love talking trumpet. Honestly, it's, it is really like, I, it is really my passion. And so thanks to Long and McQuaid for the invite and thanks to Yamaha, Jeff Houghton and Adam at Long and McQuaid for, for the great uh, work behind the scenes and before I get into my like uh, sh my little bit of a spiel that I have prepared feel free to ask questions um, if you want uh, guidance on anything specific about playing or whatever about you about anything go right ahead and if we don't have time to answer them uh, during the course of this live uh, thing I'll be sure to get to them after the fact okay so no but I'll, I'll certainly do my best so um, <clears throat> I guess um, I guess we should start with with where it, where it started. Where 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 did it begin? Uh, so I I got my start um, in my school band. I'm a product of the uh, Regina Catholic School Band, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, and I started uh, trumpet in grade six, uh, just like everybody else. Um, and I I I I that's that's basically uh, where I got most of my training. Um, I did take. A little little bit of piano and and sang in the, the the choir at church but it was like nothing formal no lessons so i was a late bloomer to being serious about trumpet and serious about music although um many of you may know well in canada anyways that in in western canada uh the band programs are very strong very prolific very active so where I went to high school, I had fantastic teachers, first off, who were like just dedicated, you know. And so we were there being sponges to, and they were throwing stuff at us, taking what, whatever we, whatever we, uh, whatever they threw at us, we took, you know. So, um, but I played in a, in a jazz band. That's not uncommon, but I played in a jazz combo. We had an honor band. I had a brass quintet. Um, the, actually the band, the band teacher actually got us a gig. I, I got paid 25 bucks to go play a gig with the brass quintet. And that was a lot of money. I, I thought that was pretty darn cool back then. <laughs> 25 bucks. Hey, anyway. Um, so then after I, uh, graduated from high school, I actually, uh, quit the trumpet. I actually put it under, uh, literally in the closet. <laughs> Or, yeah, yeah, in, in, in the, in, under the bed or whatever. 
And uh, the the funny story is is uh, that I I just thought I was going to do something else. I I just thought I was going to I don't know if my mom was a social worker, and I knew I wanted to work with people and help people or something like that, you know. And I don't know. And so I I didn't play trumpet for like I don't know eight months, nine months. I, I and then I ran into this friend of mine. Uh, my my friend then and now still at the university and she was a few years ahead of me and she was studying music education and she says hey you should join the university wind ensemble um we need an extra trumpet I'm like nah no thanks nah I'm not really like that's not really my thing I'm not really and she goes no no you should check it out the music people they're really nice that they have good parties and I was like oh okay that sounds good and like literally that's how I got back into the trumpet. Isn't that funny? Typical trumpet player. Honestly, really, seriously. So then I, you know, fast forward, uh, I joined the wind ensemble and luckily the conductor of the wind ensemble was also the trumpet teacher. So I got there and they were like, yeah, yeah, you go play third trumpet. Blah, 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 blah. So after a few, like say a month or so of playing again and getting my chops back, he, he kind of saw something in me and he realized and he said you know who are you what's your deal you should be studying trumpet so I'm thankful for my friend that moment running into me saying join the because they have good parties and I'm thankful to that wind ensemble conductor uh Dr. Ed Lewis who's was was my trumpet teacher for that I mean he he, he got me on the path and so well like I said it was I was quite a late bloomer did my undergrad at U of R, or pardon me, at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. And, you know, um, I, I just didn't. And I, I, I often say, like, I feel like that feeling of, like, trying to catch up. Like, literally, uh, one of my classmates in my first year undergrad, uh, a pianist who, he's a good friend, and we always joke about this as well now. Um, <laughs> he says to me one day, so, Karen, are you going to do the concerto competition? And I was like, the what? Yeah, the concerto competition. Are you going to do that? You know, like, and I was like, well, what's a concerto? And he was just like, oh, my God, what's a concerto? I was like, yeah, yeah. So that was my level of of uh, exposure to classical music. I had, I had no idea what was going on. But I went to my teacher next week and I said, is there a concerto I can learn? Because there's this concerto competition. And he gave me the Aria Tunian because I, of course, only owned a B flat. So he gave me the Aria Tunian trumpet concerto. And yep, fast forward a couple months, learned it, learned how to double tongue. <laughs> and I won that, con I won that competition. <laughs> oh, anyways, I feel bad for those pianists who've been practicing all their whole year for to win <laughs> that thing. And anyways. There, there you go. That's 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 a funny story. After uh, being in, in Regina, I, I went to McGill because I was I learned about the Montreal Symphony and this incredible time they had in the in the eighties. This was the late eighties, and um, then I studied with. So I went. I wanted just to be there and be a part of it. So I studied with uh, both Jim Thompson uh, and Bob Early, who were in the trumpet section there at that time. And uh, extremely, extremely formative years uh, going there, being in Montreal, hearing great players who were my who were my classmates then and colleagues now, you know, uh, just killing it, you know, practicing and being a part of that community. And, and then every week, every Wednesday night and Thursday night, going to hear the Montreal Symphony, getting student rush tickets every week, no matter what they were playing. Uh, I'd sneak in for the second night after intermission, you know, to hear it twice. And um, so those were, those were, those were formative, hearing that sound, hearing that orchestra, hearing that energy. Uh, it was like glued into my brain, you know? So, but meanwhile, I always had this feeling of, of like, oh, what's a concerto? You know, like that, like I, I have a lot to learn. I have to play catch up. And I, so I always have this feeling of, and it's been a little bit of a, of, it's been a blessing, but it's also been a curse, you know, because 
I never sort of, you know, I, I never have that feeling of like, yeah, okay. I, you know, I, I, I always, uh, there's always something else that I should or could or need or want or, you know, so that led me on this path of, of always having, um, a mentor. And even though I graduated with my master's, I was like not done learning. I was not done needing guidance, of course. So I, I'm, and I'm going to do a little bit of name dropping here. Well, you know, and it's not just like I'm name dropping or whatever. It's like, I want to give credit where credit's due, you know? So all these cool things that I learned from like great, amazing players. So one ex so I would say isolate the, the, the summer I spent at the National Youth Orchestra of Canada with uh, Mr. Chickowitz was absolutely life-changing. Just his whole being and that whole, his whole concept of, of uh, it was just so good of kindness and good and being honorable. I mean, he, just his whole personality oozed goodness and his, that was just apparent in every how he operated and so that was just absolutely inspiring to be uh, around him so there there you go um that that and then i also uh i like i said i've always i've always sort of even now i've been so I, oh yes let me just after finishing my master's uh, and doing nyo it was really clear i really needed more help and so i did a self-directed study uh, and went to, down to Cleveland and took f like every, t every two months or something like that. Over the course of a year, I took lessons with Mike Sachs and heard the Cleveland Orchestra. Again, also incredible. He was ju just in that job like maybe two or three years, I think he, and it was just like, this guy was on fire, you know? It was just wicked. So that was amazing. That helped me win a job in, southwestern Ontario a smaller job uh um it's about 32 weeks I think I can't, I can't even remember but in Orchestra London Orchestra London Canada is what it was called so I played two seasons there and then following that um that was in in 1996 I was invited to um unfortunately the former principal trumpet here in at the National Arts Centre uh suffered a, a playing injury a chop injury and uh they needed they they had a, several people filling in over the course of i don't know maybe a year or something and finally they were looking for stability so they offered me a one-year contract in 1996 97 and 98 and then in 99 um i i was given given the job um and and tenure basically same day because three years three years they knew what they were getting for better or worse <laughs> <laughs> they knew what they were getting anyway so yeah but so this um this thing about about looking for um how to get like this idea of like what i was saying earlier about like needing to catch up needing to catch up i think that feeling like instilled in me like i want to get better I want to get better. And so that's kind of been my drive this whole career. And I've been now here 26 years, I think, here in Ottawa playing principal trumpet of the orchestra here. And I just, I'm glad to say, I, I, I feel like I still am on this trajectory of like each year things seem to be like, oh yeah, okay, boom, that's going in the right direction. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to go that way. I want to go that way. So, um, so how, how do we do that? You know, and I, I think, I think that it, this is what I kind of wanted to talk about tonight, um, is, is trying to, uh, build a balanced routine or trying to build a balanced relationship with the trumpet, you know? And so I, I prepared this little sort of, I thought I would just go over my, my approach to the trumpet right now. Okay, my practice. Um, so someone asked in the question, how much do you practice in a day? I mean, that depends every day. Everyone ha depends on the work uh, schedule. If it's like the pandemic and there's nothing to do, I was practicing three hours a day. I was, I was, and that's about my maximum. I was practicing, or I should say three sessions. But I usually do anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour, sometimes 
you know, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. It just depends. So what I'm going to share with you tonight um, is just a, a snapshot of my experience right now, okay? Like, because we as humans and musicians and players, artists, whatever, we're, it's a constant change. We have, you know, there's, con there's inspiration from all sorts of places and experiences. And so, like, it's always a work in progress, like a kind of in this like, development. Like, and it, it just sort of, it's in constant change, you know, like, like kind of, kind of like the weather in Saskatchewan, like we just wait 10 minutes and it's going to change. And that's kind of like my practice routine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure we could say the same thing about the weather here in Ontario, but that's a big joke in Saskatchewan. So, but so when you're, when, what I, what I say for myself and anybody else that asks or wants to know is be curious, be curious, be interested. Like, how can I get better? What's happening? What am I doing? Um, you know, how can I push myself to, to keep moving forward? So everyone is different. Everyone has what works for them. So these are just my thoughts, you know, and I'm tweaking it all the time. Uh, and, and like, again, adapting it for like better or worse, good or evil, whatever, being mindful of the like demands of the job, but it, it always comes down to what's my goal? What do I want to achieve? What do I need? How do I get to where I want to go? You know, and it sometimes like, it might not happen. Like, obviously like trumpet is like, like you're like, you're the turtle. It's just one baby foot. This is not a race. You, this is one baby step every day. One. So the, the see, the secret is be consistent. You got to practice every day or almost every day. I advocate for taking a day off. Uh, I generally take a day off once a week. And I didn't used to do that for years and years and years. I didn't do that. And I don't know. I'm smarter now or something. Hopefully, maybe. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Chickowitz would say, like, if you practice one hour a day, that means you're not getting worse. You know, if you practice two hours or two sessions a day, that means you're like maintaining or moving slightly forward. And if you practice three sessions a day, that's when you're really trying to your your goal is you're achieving trying to achieve excellence there. So you're setting your goal. If you're putting in three sessions or more, whatever. Now, I, I do think the thing about being a successful uh, practicer is, is knowing what to practice, right? So in that way, I, and I always say this to my own students, like you are your own best teacher. You, you are the person that hears yourself all day long. I only hear you one hour a week kind of thing. So, um, so n being able to listen, uh, objectively being able to sort of dissect, discern, observe, make, make decisions, make, and the faster you can sort of figure it out, right? The faster you're going to get better, the faster you're going to keep that trajectory up, you know? So this is where I'm going to like do some name dropping. Here we go. Boom. Number one. Cause I want people to get credit. I want you to think that I'm that smart. I'm not that smart. I mean, I play the trumpet, right? So I can't be that smart. So like, but I had great smart mentors, right? So number one, Barbara Butler, she, she, I heard her say at this master class that she, she, uh, tells the students to like make a list of 20 attributes of your playing. List of 20, starting with number one is what you think you do the best. And number two, do, 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 and number 20 is what, whatever in your playing is, needs the most work. Okay. And that's your guide. And you, you use this list. Now making that list is, is hard work. You got to do some honest, honest and legit, like soul searching of like, okay, what is it I do, do well? And you know, what, what, 
what's weaker? And the basically, you start with your strengths, and I always like to start every every day. I always try to play like where I can actually like play and sound good, and I'm not going to get too upset if I suck or whatever, you know. So, I I I. I always start with something like working on sound, getting a good sound, getting good, good production going. And that's my base, you know? So it, on your list of 20 in your practice routine or your practice sessions, whatever you want to call them, like if like, say for example, your list of 20 numbers, one through five are things you already do quite well, right? Or the, those are your strengths. And so 15 through 20 are the weaker elements of your playing. Well, number 15 through 20, those are things you got to do every day. You got to, and this is something that I made a mistake years ago of like, I would just be practicing things I was already good at, you know? And a lot of people say like, if you're in the practice room, you should sound terrible because you're working on things that you're not good at, you know? Well, I would probably like quit the trumpet after two days if that was my approach. Honestly, I, it's too, like, it's too upsetting to be like, Honk, honk, oh my God, that was terrible, honk, you know. So I like to start every day, like I said, where I feel like you, you, you're building, like start from where you're, where you're solid and we, then we push the limits out from there, right? So, but the, pro the thing is, don't spend too long on the stuff that you like. Don't shine up that silver thing too much, you know? Uh, it's already shiny. You're already good at that thing. We got to move on quickly to the things that, that we're not that good at. So numbers 15 to, through 20 in your list every day, right away. Boom. For me, it's Clark one. I do it slurred, single tongue, double tongue, triple tongue. Boom. I get straight to that finger coordination, articulation, response, range, the whole range takes me about eight minutes to get through the whole thing. I don't always do the whole thing, but if, if I do, that's give or take how long it takes me. And you know, like, and so then, then on your list of 20 numbers, say t like five through 15, you're doing every other day. And the numbers one through five, you're doing some of them every day. Cause that's where you're good. And you set, you set yourself up and it's a good solid base. And then you do that every three days. So you, we want to be like people say, you want to be stirring all the pots on the stove. You know, you don't want something to burn or go, get cold. You're making this meal of trumpet playing. So you want to touch all the bases. Meanwhile, looking for balance. If you're at university or you're like, you know, like myself, a, a professional or, or whatever, you know, a student and you're at work, like say if I'm at work and we're playing like Mahler or Bruckner, I'm not going home and I'm not playing big, loud, heavy stuff. No, I need to balance that. You look for balance in your practicing. It has, that's why I say it has to be tweaked all the time, has to be adaptable. So we, the guy who I replaced, the former principal trumpet here, Pace Sturdivant, he said something to me years ago. If you're playing Mahler at work, you got to play Mozart at home. And if you're playing Mozart at work, you got to play Mahler at home. So you know what that means? That means like if you're playing light and soft and not very much at work or at school or whatever your thing is, then you got to come home and you got to put the time in. You got to check those boxes of like, yeah, I played high, I played loud, I played this, I played that, you know, so that you can touch all the bases so that you're ready to play anything at any time. And I can tell you that this has served me well. Um, I had a... Let me just grab a little sip of water here. I had a situation where, um, so like, okay, so yeah, I had this, like, I, I, I use the Tom Hooten practice chart. Okay. Tom Hooten. Boom. I attended a masterclass that he gave and you can download whatever, but check out, that's my practice chart. Boom. My list of 20. Check those boxes. It's so satisfying, man. What's so, why is it so satisfying? Like job done. Yes. I should give myself a gold star. That'd be awesome. <laughs> gold star. Gold star. <laughs> anyway. So I started, I like five years ago or something. I saw this Tom Hooten. He's a principal Trump in LA for those that don't know. But I saw this master class and he had this practice chart thing. Um, and then like the Barbara Butler list of 20. So like, that's my list down the side. And these are the days of the weeks at the top and jing, jing, jing. And I get the stuff done. Right. 
So I was doing that. And I'm digging this, man. I'm just practicing chug, chug, chug away. And then, um, it's why in, in my fundamental, where I work on basics every morning, I'm checking off this list. Well, so about four, I don't know, four or five years ago. So well after I was using this chart for quite a long time, um, I, we were in this big, huge festival at work. Like we had this stack of music this big and we were like playing like three concerts, at, uh, five concerts in like three days or something. It was just wild and all really challenging stuff. There was like Gershwin and, and super tons of trumpet, like Stravinsky and that Charlie Chaplin movie. And, but there was also, also like these modern pieces, every single concert had, um, like either a Canadian piece or some contempt, some contemporary piece. And so I had this stack of music in my case and I just schlep it all to work and schlep it home and, you know, just check, 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 get through the, the huge list. Well, one week, like there was this one piece, I forget who it was by now, but it was, had a really tricky trumpet part, like super busy, tons of notes. And I was like, oh yeah, I got time to look at that. That's not till next week. I go, I've got a whole seven days to learn those notes, you know, kind of thing. Well, I was wrong. I, I, I mixed up the contemporary pieces and it was the week prior. Well, lo and behold, you know, like touch all the bases. So if with your routine, your practice fundamentals, so you can be ready to play anything at any time. So yeah, man, I was like, it was like, like this crazy tons of trouble. And I was like, man, I got this. It was boom. It was one of those moments where I was like, yes, it's working. What, what I'm doing is paying off, you know? So I wish, wish we had those all the time, but so, so there you go. That's sort of the, that's sort of how I start, right? It, it, like, so you, that, that's just my advice. So, you know, you get your list and just, you look for balance. You want to touch all the elements of playing that you can high, low, low, low high, low, loud, soft, you know, fast, low, whatever. So the other game changer that I learned from Tom Hooten, also Tom Hooten, beep, name drop, um, is he uses this app called Seconds Pro. It's an athletic timer app and it's customizable, okay? So it costs like maybe six or seven bucks, but it's amazing. So here you go. It I schedule in, this is my, what I start, uh, this is my warm up in the morning or like my first routine. And I schedule in the, the app goes do do you know, then, and I schedule in the rest. So two minutes and then rest for one minute, three minutes, you know, and I, it just goes on like that for about an hour. And it reminds me to, to get the horn off my face, but it also reminds me to get back. You know, if I get distracted by like whatever, sending an email or like the dog or blah, 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 who knows. So this is my, when you are planning your practice session, you gotta have, you gotta have your tools. So this is one thing. So I, I got my, I'm not talking about, you need the pencil of course, but I'm talking about like, so I have the practice chart. That's my tool. I have this app. I also use, I'm just going to name these apps. Tonal energy tuner is my metronome tuner app. And also the tempo metronome app because it, it has a, um, it has a countdown for, and you can do a minute drill. You can do a minute of practicing and it has a countdown. And, and I, it ju I just think it's really, really convenient for me. So I get those things out. I got my practice chart. The other thing I have here, like at the ready, we're here down. This is my practice studio. It's like very, very non-glamorous, very, like very dead, very hard to play actually. But I always start... Um, <clears throat> so I got like my little tools here. I've got my breathing tube thing that I bought at Canadian Tire for like literally 69 cents or something. And I do breathing exercises with this. I use the straw, a regular old drinking straw, like that is give or take the aperture of the trumpet, give or take. It's a little bit too big, but nonetheless, um, it's a plastic drinking straw that I've cut and I. I use that with Arnold Jacobs name drop when I took lessons from him. Um, we use that. Um, I use this toothpick as also as a 
aperture focuser that allows me to like be aware of corner activity. I, I learned it um, by watching a, a horn symposium last year on on the in COVID, all the online things like this, you know. Um, so and I got the breathing tube. I've got my breathing bag, the five liter bag I use sometimes. The Voldyne. No, I mean Inspiron, sorry. Voldyne breathing up. These are right here at the ready. But you know, honestly, you, you don't necessarily need those things. Like this thing for 69 cents at Canadian Tire. Perfectly awesome. Okay. So, um, anyway, the other thing, I've got a few other things like for, for teaching and for myself is the anti-pressure thing that it will stop. You put this in the lead pipe. Um, yeah, the receive and the mouthpiece here, and it will stop the vibration. So if you're using too much pressure, you know, too much left arm, it's really good for teaching, but it's also good, super good reminder for me. And I also have my little, I'm using this uh, compression um, gauge that I also learned about on the internet. <laughs> my new, my new mentor, internet name drop. But I mean, there's so many fantastic online uh, videos that we can learn um, from people generously offering stuff. I always have water because it's so important. Cheers, everybody. Always have water. Hydration is so important, not only for our physical health, but for the health of our chops. And the other thing that I have here, always, 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 which might surprise some of you, but whatever, it is what it is, is the exercise bands. This and this. And when I do, when the, 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 the timer, Seconds Pro Timer tells me to stop, I do a series of exercises for my posture to strengthen because trumpet, you know, you know, we're like this, right? Where thing, things are rolled in and like for me I spent years playing like with my elbows here and like that is just so terrible for posture and for breathing we need this whole torso to be open you know so now but you need strength between the shoulder blades you need strength in your back I mean you know for me so I've I've been actively weightlifting I know guns guns yeah right but no for four or five years i've been actively weightlifting and it's a very slow pro process but nonetheless here i am and uh hopefully trying to avoid injury because it's a physical instrument right so i thought that so there that that's how i i mean that's a lot of talking and a lot of saying things but that's what I have on hand, that's, these are the things I use are at the ready. And so I thought maybe we would, I could even put the timer on. We would go through my first sort of session a little bit of, well, I, I suppose I could answer questions if there's some, maybe I'll have a look at the chat. How is this going? Um, okay. Yeah. So generally practice anywhere between I mean it just depends I, I I'm gonna talk about that actually later uh okay yeah right excellent okay these are great questions I'm just quickly reading them um once you get to a rehearsal what you usually do is a warm-up and get ready to play I suppose you all can see the questions what do you do mentally to ground yourself these are all things I'm going to talk about great uh, calm your nerves. Nerves. Yeah. Okay. Great. Flutter tonguing. Okay, cool. All right. All right. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, I can talk like that. Let's just go through Let's just go through it and I'll touch those things. And, and so first thing, um, in the morning, um, I usually am, you know, like making coffee and getting the water and all the things, but I'm already thinking about what I'm going to be practicing. Right. I, even before I get down here or if I'm going to be up in the living room or whatever, if, if, if it, I have, cause it's a better acoustic up there sometimes at my house, you know, so, um, so, and even before I start the timer, I'm doing like just lip flaps like that. 
you know. And the other thing I read this, I read this, um, I saw this article about, uh, about uh, running or like, oh, you see like on the Olympics, right? These people like, boom, 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 like trying to keep their banging, banging on their muscles, their big muscles. So I like this idea of like tap, tap, tap on the, around the, the chops on the face. It's a little bit like this tactile, um, uh, experience. I actually got it sort of inspired by my trainer guy at the gym back when we were like in, working in person. He would be like, like say for example, like these, um, traps let's say traps are that like they're hard to isolate or something he would be i'd be doing a pull down and he would just be tapping the traps or or like my side here to for this tactile awareness of the muscle so brings blood flow and brings attention so like i like this like tap 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 on my face like and then all of a sudden i feel like i can feel it now even sort of like a little bit of a um stimulation you know and then sometimes depends on the morning and if I'm in a rush, I will get going on the free buzz without the tonal energy tuner that has a drone because I really am digging the drone. But So to be honest, I'm usually making coffee and I try to start, I don't have perfect pitch. So, I mean, that's a concert F or middle G. So I, I'm trying to like get foo, not no tongue start, no aggressive start, like a, and if I have to like come up from, You know, just trying to get the, the response happening. Because for, for me, response is like, well, for all of us, of course, response is super important. So, and I learned from Paul uh, Paul Barron, you know, Paul Barron, the lead player, um, Canadian guy, but he, he lives in the States and tours like all these Broadway shows. He's a fantastic player. He starts with foo. I, I often use poo and then P-U-U. -U -U. A lot of people talk about who poo too. Who with air poo with the lips together but Paul Barron brought, uh, foo like this feeling of foo brings the, the center forward so very very easy easy not too loud not too aggressive buzzing free buzzing then I always use the visualizer this is a mouthpiece cutaway but actually, at Long and McQuaid, I bought this. It's like a, I think it's a standard 7C with a, like a, you know. And it's so great for teaching because it's hard to see what's in there. But I think it's so great for practicing. Because you want the response. You want the vibration at the aperture to come very easily, you know. Great Ron Parch made this for me. So fancy. I try to, if there's a bump in there where there's a break, I try to smooth that around. I try not to play too loud because I don't want the aperture to be too open. I don't know if this is making sense for everybody, but then I always go to the mouthpiece. And for years, I buzzed super loud and super like, Barr! you know, and um, I can't remember who told me that, that, that that's, yeah, I think it was the Jim Pandolfi brass chat where like, anyway, it made me aware like, oh my God, I'm buzzing so loud. It's like I'm buzzing triple forte or something. So now I learned on the internet, my new mentor, my new trumpet mentor. I learned from a Jeroen Berwartz, the amazing Belge uh, trumpet player. Amazing trumpet player. He does, like, when he's buzzing, he does a little half cover here. 
Can you see like this? I put my my finger half it so that it creates a little resistance so that it's very similar or like my, my you know, I've seen people do this. My buddy Stefan Bolak of Montreal Stephanie, he does this sometimes he warms up. So just a little and not too loud. For me, I don't buzz too loud. And like, let's get the... Sometimes I add in a little tongue, articulation, you know. Honestly, sometimes it's just quite rigmarole, quite ad lib, but sometimes it's very uh, controlled with the metronome, like having response happen at the right. If I have a lot of time, I use the drone, I use the tuner, I do controlled long tones. Um, and... I, I find that that's a great way to start, but these days I'm back working. It's busy schedule. I'm, I'm, I want to get to the horn as soon as I can. So it's a little more <laughs> like on the fly and so, something else. So then, so we go free buzz, visualizer buzz, light mouthpiece buzz. And something I learned from Phil Smith, who actually was one of my mentors. I did another self-directed study like about 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, about 10 or 15 years ago uh, when he was still playing with the New York Philharmonic. Um, again, I, I went down uh, every month or every every two months and had lessons with him um, and saw the New York Philharmonic. And, and anyway, so, but this I learned, uh, he was doing a, a, some kind of talk on YouTube actually and um, so he he wants to get the vibration uh, to start very easily he uses the he starts just with he showed this just taking a nice relaxed breath and just blowing wind no buzzing okay and then bringing the the lead pipe up to the mouthpiece and then when the mouthpiece is gets longer by adding the lead pipe it creates resistance and then the buzz happens it's science don't ask me but i do know that i like doing this and i'll tell you why is because it makes me aware of that spot where does it start where does the vibration start and we want to have especially in my job uh, playing in a, in a smaller orchestra, like our bigger, the biggest we get is about 75 people. So our dynamic range is very, is on the very, very soft to also very loud, but it's very, very refined. So that's something that I have to keep as a priority. I have to keep stirring that pot big time. So let me just show you. So I just blow air. Uh... And then at a certain point, oh, it starts. And somehow that gives me like, oh yeah, real tactile awareness of my aperture. Then I want to sort of grab onto that. That's where the sensitivity is. So this is just lead pipe buzzing. Again, I learned this on, on the internet. I've been doing a lot of internet searching. No, no. It just actually came up through Facebook. This, um, like using the lead pipe as a practice tool. It's a Bill Adams thing. Um, it's been around a long time, you know, so. But it's pretty great to get, get things moving, get the vibration happening right away. Also for articulation. If you're doing a hammer tongue in there, it's going to sound duck, 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 you know? So that's a concert E flat and then an F is the next tone up, up.
I do, I like doing the glissing over the bumps, like around the concert A, where that's like, I find it's a great workout. You can also do a good aperture check if you have students, if to make sure they're really getting, um, I do it for myself too, like real focus on the corners, supporting with the corners, is just do, blocking the end and do what we call a block buzz. So I'm still blowing, but the blocking is causing the vibration to stop. And then when I release, it comes back. So it's, but it does, you don't want to blow too hard against it because it can create tension. But just, it, for me, it brings great awareness of the corners. And then we want to talk about, like, for me, getting that middle range to the high range to the upper high range. So that, 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 then we start dealing with your intraoral tongue position. Ta, te, ti, ti, right? This was what we learned in the Maggio book. something that it's funny that it's a relatively new concept for me like given that I've been playing trumpet like 40 years or something but nobody talked to me about that in my as a younger player but it's the thing it allows us to play with more ease it allows us to be if you're it's, it's it allows us to play more efficiently so anyway back to the routine I do those series of buzzing and that actually takes only about five minutes I'm done doing a lot of talking and then I, you get into the sound. And I like using, lately I've been into Stamp, James Stamp, Warm Up 3B. And I mentioned the Maggio book, M-A-G-G-I-O. Um, I, can, I can send that information in the comments but so and every time this uh the two the i'm you know i've got my my app going on the timer and when it when it goes to the scheduled breaks that's when i do my stretching and if we have time i'll show you my stretches later but if we don't have time i do stretching i check my posture that's huge chest up chin down chin check your we don't want the trumpet. We don't want to go to the trumpet. We want to have good posture and we want the trumpet to come to us. Right? We want a nice little uh, pizza pie here. Slice of pizza. And you don't want to be like, I played like that for years. It's terrible. Don't do it. Don't do it, kids. Play safe. But it takes strength. I just didn't have the physical strength so I needed to use my hips. I needed to use my, my, my torso, which is why I, I'm lifting the weights, you know? So that's much better. So, um, and I, I, I go through the various, at that point, that's when I'm like getting into my sound, trying to get a nice sound. I, I use the Chicklets Flow Studies, uh, not that much, but on occasion I use the Maggio book, a uh, warm up in there. I, I love doing the stamp. 3B. Um, we're really running out of time, so I was going to demonstrate all that, but but I won't. But when I'm doing this every day, I'm trying to be mindful. And I'm trying to ask, I ask myself questions like, how did that feel? Oh, how did that sound? Do I like that sound? Is it centered? Is it attractive? You know, and when I'm working on repertoire, like these, are, you have to ask these questions, like back to the, you are your own best teacher. Are the basics basics there, the blocks of music, the blocks, sound, pitch, time, right? It's, it's, that's all, that's so important for, and then for me, is there ease? Do I have tension? Tension is an overtone killer. If you have tension in your body while you're playing and in your shoulders and not, and not even just like your chops, it's like your whole body makes this sound. If you have tension, you won't have a good sound. You won't. Tension and this like is is an overtone killer. So 
you, you have to stay, things have to stay loose, but the sound and the energy, the work comes from the airspeed and the balance of airspeed, corners, tongue position, aperture, right? So I try to be very attentive to how the sound, uh, how the sounds are starting. How am I starting my notes? I, and it comes back to like, because maybe because I didn't have a teacher in high school, but I had a hammer tongue, like, oh man, I've spent my whole life so far trying to get off that articulation, over articulation train and trying to let the air do the work. And I, it's a total, it's a total crutch using too much articulation to get the sound going. You want the air to do the work and then that's super, it's super easy. Like the, the, the articulation is just clarity. It's just like clarity on how we start the note. That's adding character, right? So I ask these questions. How are the starts? Is my sound even? A am I being agile? A being, it's like as a trumpet player, playing light and agile is much harder. It's like being a ballerina. You need such physical conditioning to control the light and the agile playing heavy and loud is is easier it, it, you need strength for that obviously but i'm talking about like you ever seen the ballet dancers and their body it's like so all and then then of course the absolute most important element is am i saying something with what i'm playing am i sharing bringing something giving bring your your heart, your soul, your, your, your voice to, to the audience that you're sharing with, you know? Um, <clears throat> yeah. So let, how, how's, how's it going? Let me just look at the questions. I, I know there was a few mental, uh, cause I do, I do, uh, I do, um, I do. How would you prep to play the Brandenburg? Don't ask me that. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't play that piece. <laughs> Ah, any tips for learning a non-linear phrase of music? Oh yeah, okay, like, oh yeah, like, uh, like con contemporary music or something? Tips for someone to correct their embouchure. Yeah, oh boy, yeah. Well, that's, so, that's a good question. Um, a little water, well, hydration, it's important. Hydration's the key. So... <clears throat> So basically, the, um, I'm going to answer a few of the questions right now. So generally my warm up, my first session in the day can be anywhere from 30 minutes, depending on how much time I have to an hour. And then I, if I'm going to another rehearsal, I drive to work. And the nice thing is that you warm up at home, the drive to work or your travel to school or whatever gives time for the chops, the swelling to go down and things to settle any kind of like, and then basically uh, like 15 minutes before the rehearsal is when I kind of start my warm up again, 15 or 20, not, not that much. And then I'm ready to go. So that's that, that before a gig. Um, <clears throat> so let's go in. There's quite a few questions about, about nerves and mentally grounding myself. Um, um, so I, I have some, I have some, I have worked a lot on this myself. I, for myself, for my students, because I'm curious about it, because I get nervous, you know? So like nerves, um, number one, we can, we can, I've always felt, and I've always said this, someone said that to me, and I, I don't remember who said it, but you gain confidence from your preparation. So if you're super prepared, you've done all that you can do, you, you know, you gain confidence from that, that like you can play the piece so that the, there's, there's no reason why you can't be confident because you put the time in preparation, uh, drives confidence so if you're if you put the time in competence becomes get competence and your, your preparation gives you confidence 
And anyway, they, they, they're, they're upset. At. So in terms of managing my own nerves and stress, I, I meditate. I use an app. It costs money, and but you can do this for free. It's a simple just quietening the mind. I use the 10% Happier app, meditation app. And I just think there's so many incredible things that I've learned from that. So the, the mind is the most powerful muscle we have, like really. So, and actually you can learn so much from watching the show Ted Lasso, right? That guy has some brilliant personal guidance comments. Be a goldfish. Forget about the mistakes. Let it go. It's not serving anybody, you know? So, and in this app, the, the, the meditation app, 10% happier, one of the, one of the guys who gives us, it's a series of courses that they have. And one of the guys used to be the, um, used to be the meditation coach for the Chicago Bulls and the Los Angeles Lakers, like an NFL team. So this is like these top level sports teams, highest superstars, all have meditation coaches. Isn't that mind boggling? It's something I didn't know until I knew about this app. And he basically, like, there's just like, there are all those things that we know, like replay your successes. Those concerts that you did well, have them close to you, write them in a book, have them in a file on your phone. I have mine in a file on my phone, you know? And if you need, and just delete the bad, press the delete button. It does not help you in any way to relive those. And, and the more you, like thoughts are things that have effects, right? So what you think you'll create, if you're always thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I missed that high C, I missed that high C. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to miss the high C. Like, so, or if you're sitting there thinking, I, Susan Slaughter taught me this name drop. I am strong like bull. You got to go play out. You got, you're going to play whatever Zarathustra, you know, like, and you're just sitting there and you just like ground their feet into the chair, ground that butt into the chair. And I am strong like bull. You've put the time in, you've done your reps. It's going to like, and the, I think like, you just got to go for it. You know, there's no, there's no other way. Like, and if you miss it, well, at least you have the pride of knowing that you were laying it all out. You put it all out in the field, you know, that, that kind of stuff is, is, is gold, I think for your, the inner voice that like those, um, how to calm myself. And I, I, I'm going to say I was a little nervous before starting this thing. Like I don't do live streams. Like this is so weird talking to myself. Thank God there's, I thank God. Anyway, yeah. So like, but so what did I do? I did the square breathing. Okay. I learned this from yoga where it's inhale for four counts. It's square because you use this visual. It's very easy. Inhale for four counts. Hold your breath for four counts. Exhale for four counts. Hold your breath for four counts. Inhale for four. Hold for four. Exhale for four. Hold for four these that is known to calm your nervous system it brings down it's and and um the the uh increased increased exhalation so in for four counts out for six in for four counts a longer exhalation is also known to lo lower the levels of your 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 nervous system, the, the anxiety. So, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the, the other things I do when I'm nervous or about nerves, you know, is, is I manage with exercise. I mean, just manage my stress with exercise so that, cause I, it just, I, 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 I then I, I manage, I manage my, my daily anxiety with that. But this, um, visualization, sitting quietly hearing your amazing sound that you want to make you know feeling feeling those you know this piece whatever you're playing you know it well 
because you put the time in because you know that works because it does and you and visualize what you're doing and you know obviously you want to have you want to be confident with your inside voice you know you don't want to be like burr, 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 walking around your school or wherever you are being like this like you know i'm confident no you want we want to be the external voices is humble and empathetic and and a good colleague you know but you want the inside voice to be strong and to be like solid grounded on your feet you know and the, the other thing that i find that helps a lot is is this quietening of before you go taking time and then before you you start your playing whatever it is like this idea of, of having uh, of having gratitude like count your blessings whatever it is uh for your whatever it is that's in your life that makes you feel good whether it's your dog your goldfish your partner you know and you just and like take your phone and and you just I have the picture on my phone and that the picture of the person that I love makes me feel good. So when I look at that picture, so that's what happens there. That feeling of makes you feel good and relaxes you. It's releasing dopamine into your brain and ser and serotonin. Those are like the feel good body drugs. So then you're like, you're, you're thinking about your the people you love, you got the feel good stuff going through your body and it, it has this cumulative effect, right? And then happy, it's, it's Don Green said that Don Green, the, the mental, the sports psychologist guy who works at Juilliard and stuff. He's, he says he knows happy musicians play better people who are in a good mood. So like watch a funny movie. If you got a stressful concert, like use laughter, listen to a comedian, um, let the dopamine, like the feel good stuff go in your body instead of like all this, Oh my God, Oh my God, you know, it's so hard. Oh my God. You know, anyway. Um, did that answer those questions? Someone to change their embouchure. That's a tough, that's a tough thing. Uh, I, I think that I think it's very hard to do, uh, to answer that. Um, I would suggest you look for guidance from a teacher because it, you know, generally, generally left to right doesn't matter too much. It's the up and down, you know? So, um, Um, okay. I can tell, let me see. I'm just reading these questions. So mentally ground. Yeah. Trumpet, trumpet is winning the battle. Yeah. Oh, I've got an idea, but like if, if your chops are, I wanted to share that. That's great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Juice bin. I don't know. Uh, flutter tonguing. Oh yeah. Okay. That's a great, thank you, Rick. Hi Rick. Thanks for watching. Um, learning, weird lines so i would just say there's um a big study that's been done by christian steenstrup very famous trumpet pedagogue and danish guy teaching at the royal academy as well i think in london where uh singing uh makes us learn faster so singing solfege you know singing your part singing the lines with your t if you don't have a, a p piano or whatever use the use a, tu a, a tuner to give it you a drone um, um yeah so that th I, th I that's how i would do it instead of or or if it's something that's really also weird is i i will often play it down the octave uh or you know reduce the intervals if you're like trying to learn something really challenging like learn one note at a time like um, you know, then add then two, then three, then four, learn the intervals in that way, a methodical way. Um, so a few questions here about, um, managing, uh, chops, um, and about this, uh, the Canadian tire. So it's just, I use for breathing exercises. Uh, there's, you can, uh, you know, in for four, out for four, in for four, out for two in for two out for four various 
Uh, there's all sorts of great. The breathing gym is is great. People, a lot of people use that. Um, I just do it for m myself. I I sometimes use the. Very often I use the metronome. Um, Something like that. Very often. That, I, it's just a reminder. Oh, yeah, that's, hey, body, that's what it's like to feel full, right? A daily, because because basically we all find some lazy way to like, I, I'm constantly having to remind myself, like, take a relaxed breath, take a full breath. Just, you know, you need air, Karen. This thing needs air. <laughs> What's my problem? Anyway, there you go. Um, talking about days when the trumpet is winning, uh, winning the game. So I did make a little few notes here of, um, strategies for recovery because honestly, I am going through a very bad spell of chops right now. I think I'm on week two and, uh, I gotta say that I've been lucky. I haven't had I haven't had terrible chops like this for a long time. I've had a good run of, uh, I don't know what's, I think we're playing harder stuff. We've got to play Bruckner Symphony. Um, and it's just maybe heavier playing than I'm, I don't know. Um, but I'm going, I always go back to basics, but these, this is what I do. Okay. This is what I've been doing. Number one, hydration. It's no joke. <laughs> hydration is no joke. Yes. Um, we have to think like an elite athlete because that's what we need. We're putting these little muscles and these little, this little tissue and these muscles to these incredible paces, like ridiculous things that we're making this do, right? So you have to put that in your mindset. And so that's why I love watching the Olympics. I just, uh, I just love it because they talk about the mental prep. Especially this last one, the Winter Olympics, I found they did a lot of talking about mental prep. Hydration. So, rest. Rest on the trumpet. Sleep. Rest your body. If you burn these things, you need to, the body needs time to recover. So, sleep as much as you can. If you can take a nap, I find sometimes, like after the dress rehearsal in the morning, and the chops are terrible, whatever. I find if I have a nap, um, usually by night, it's better. Hydration. I, I'll say it again. And then there's the, like like some kind of like medication. Advil. If you can't take Advil, there's the natural Arnica. Or people are talking, I've not used it, but this bromelain thing is also a natural anti-inflammatory. Those are anti-inflammatories, okay? Ice. Athletes have a sore whatever, they put ice on it. What do we do? Put ice on there. I even know some people who use Preparation H on their lips. No joke. I don't, but some people do. To take down swelling, it makes sense. It's an anti-inflammatory. The other thing is I do quite often is stretching the muscles of the face. So we're doing this all day. So when you're doing that, you want to do the contrary, right? Pull the dizzy cheeks here. Here. You know, it looks goofy. I don't do it in public. Of course, I just did it on the internet. Whatever. <laughs> um, I will do uh, low, super low, soft uh, long tones. The low F sharp that they, in the Caruso method, like very wispy, almost not responding low F sharp. <laughs> As slow, as soft, soft, soft as you can manage. Slow, low, soft Clarks. Um, the other thing that uh, has been a game changer, I actually learned from my former colleague, uh, Second Trumpet Air Group of the NAC Orchestra, because I had, I had stuff. I had, I had a recital coming. I had to get this, you know. I had to keep practicing, but I blew my chops out on track five, and. Uh, 
what can I do? And he suggested, which has been amazing. Now you might not, everybody can't do this because you don't have the liberty or whatever, but keep that in mind. He suggested short sessions many times in the day. Like sometimes I do three minutes and then walk away, come back 45 minutes an hour, another three minutes. Usually I do like five minutes, five to 10 minutes, depending how bad it is. <laughs> And I'm telling you, the mental game of like, oh God, my chops, oh my God, it just doesn't help. You have to like, let the body give, give the blood flow, you know, use some tactile, get, let the blood come there and let the body recover. So five minutes, like 10 times in the day, if you can, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's, and then if you're having to learn, like, you know, if you're having to learn new music, you know, or prepare music, or whatever, use this singing, use the sight singing. There's this, the bulletproof musician, uh, back to the sort of nerves thing. That is an amazing resource, bulletproofmusician.com, I think it is, where, uh, where I read that article that this, the author Christian Steenstrup was, um, so I'll sing, I'm sing, I'm singing Bruckner six, you know, cause I don't want to practice too much of it and we're playing it. So, um, so that, that, that helps. Um, time off is amazing. If you can take a day or if you've really done it, I know some people who are after big weeks, they take two days off. They need, they need it. Um, so, um, I think, those are, those are the strategies that have, that have helped me. Um, I wanted to, uh, talk a little bit about some production techniques, which I have found super valuable. Um, so yeah, if I can just, we're almost running out of time here. So I'm, I'll try and get to at, at what, there's another question. What age did you notice? Uh, changes in your playing how do you work around any age, age related things yeah I mean I'm fully aware that <laughs> life is like an arc you know like I'm fully aware that that the the career is going to be like that um but I'm doing my best to like have it not keep keep, keep <laughs> doing my best to have the the down so uh, but I will say there's for sure things that I find recovery is the biggest thing that I notice as I get older. I used to be able to like do play, go crazy. And the next day, oh yeah, I wake up, I'm fine. But now I need a little more time to get things warmed up, get things moving in a way. That's, I find recovery. And for, for me, actually, it's the tongue speed. I used to have a super fast single tongue. And uh, now it's, it's just not as fast. And I do, I do minute drills like, like Chris Gecker explains in his book of single tongue, double tongue, triple tongue, and K tongue for a minute. And, and I, you know, I, I do those. And if I don't, I really notice it. If I don't check and I don't do them every day, but if I don't do them a few times a week, I really notice a difference. Anyway, so let me just spend a little bit of time going a quick run through of some production tools or techniques that I use that, that help me. Okay. So number one thing, and I think for students and, and teachers is posture. So the you got to check the posture, chest high, chest is up. The chin is down. We want, so you got to think like you're an opera singer. The opera singers aren't out there singing like this, you know, they're not, they're, they're singing like, you know, this is what we need so that some people say like nose in front of chin, chest high, chin down, bring the trumpet to you, not you to the trumpet. These are like basic things, but super important. Then breathing, of course, has to be natural. I like to do longer breaths. Now I find it a short breath often gets me a, a tense and I don't. So when I can, I try to take a long, slow breath and low in, to let all of the diaphragm 
the lo and and the sides as you know we, we we forget we think it's just like up and down with the lungs you know but it's actually out as well you know so i often always have my students and myself as a check is but sit on a chair and bend over as if i'm like going to touch my toes and then take an inhale with the restriction of my chest on on my um thighs Okay, you take this inhale, so obviously more air is going to go on the back body. Well, then you do the same thing. You sit up straight and you do the same inhalation. And pow, it's way easier. Um, so that's a super easy breathing check, making sure. So, But, you know, engaging low abs, the pelvic floor, you know, and relaxing for me, relaxing my abs before I do an inhalation is a, is a game changer. Um I like to use the straws if I'm doing something like, you know, something articulated, I don't know, for example, just do that with the straw and try not to have hammer tongue. And then the same thing. And I always feel like, oh yeah, this little reminder of focusing the air, letting the air go through, relaxing my body gets more air through. I like to use flutter tongue as a practice tool, um, especially on, on like lyrical things, you know. So just something lyrical, whatever, do flutter tongue creates resistance and then you then you it's a trick you know you blow against the resistance then you take the flutter tongue away and whew, you know so I'll play with the flutter tongue and then I take the flutter tongue away whoops <laughs> well I've been doing that for years my teacher Bob Early at McGill taught me that so last year I did uh, the hoot camp uh, with Tom Hooten online and he showed me this uh, pencil on the valves technique so if you're finding there's some kind of lip that you can't get the your air through your articulation he showed me this pencil on the valve so you take the pencil and with your left hand you hold the pencil there in the valves so let's say you're gonna play again the same lick like just a so I'm going to hold it that there and I'm going to play. It's going to stop. Oopsie. It's going to obviously stop. It's going to half valve all the valves. But it's again, it's a resistance training. You're blowing against the resistance. So. And then you take the resistance away and whew, right. That really works. It's, I, I find he demonstrated on Ravel Piano Concerto. If anybody that's an orchestral player knows that, that's a notey, around, jumpy, around kind of excerpt. Um, a, I, th I find a really good practice tool uh, for getting even young students to learn a hard lick is actually to practice with the left hand. So let's just say that. For me, anything involving the third finger, I'm sorry if that was loud, I was just playing into the mic. Anyway. But there's something about using the left hand that engages something in the brain that causes this right hand to learn it quicker. Again, science, don't ask me how, I just know that it works. Um, obviously, uh, um, contrasting licks like if it's a slurred lick and you're having trouble, try tonguing it. If it's a tonguing lick, try slurring it, getting the air going. Um, <clears throat> for sure, something that has helped me really embracing this concept that is in the James Stamp method book of this idea of when we're going up, we think down. 
and when we're going down we think up like in the 3b warm-up for example <laughs> the pedals I'm thinking up with my air and my even and when I'm going up to the high range I'm thinking down down it keeps yeah and tongue position the other thing that I was talking about tongue position from the Maggio book it also a good way tool I think for for teachers to use is this idea of whistling and what happens to your tongue inside your mouth when you're whistling that's what we need to do um, with trumpet playing and I and and so and finding this balance of so I haven't talked much about the aperture except beaming but like the aperture is open in the low range and very focused in the high range open aperture slow air more focused aperture fast air high tongue position that's how we play and this balance between those things it, it's and the people who are like super prolific in the high range have it figured out like playing the Brandenburg for example is the it's this idea of getting good compression and uh letting <clears throat> um okay one thing you, yeah okay hammer tongue oh that that's just like that's sorry it's just uh using a lot of articulation to get the the get the you know so i don't know what could i play um you know, I don't know. Okay. Sorry if that was loud. But like, so that's fair. That, that, I mean, that probably sounded okay, but let me do like way too much articulation. You know, it, it's like almost like disrupts the vibration and the sound so if but actually the ear the listener hears you think you're hearing these great players the london symphony and all these guys playing this music of john williams you think they're using a lot of tongue 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 but actually they're not they're using a lot of air very vibrant very fast air and the articulation is just for clarity it's actually not that heavy tongue it sounds like it is because the air is so active. That's what's the key. So when there's more air and less tongue, more overtones, better sound, better intonation, more endurance, <laughs> better control, generally all good things. Anyway, I think we're, that's, that's, I think I answered all the things, most of them. Yeah. And, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for those of you that ask questions. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that somebody was here to, to participate a little bit. It feels like I, I wasn't all by myself, uh, talking uh, alone to the world of the internet. And uh, thanks again to Long and McQuaid for this invitation, for this uh, opportunity to share my thoughts about trumpet playing and Adam for the behind the scenes stuff. Jeff, thanks for the invite. And I thought I would, um, you know, something, the pandemic was very tough time, obviously, for all of us, everybody. No one, no one got away with uh, thinking it was amazing you know but but I must say there were so many challenges that we all know but there were some really positive things that came out of that and for, something for me that happened was I sort of took on this attitude because it was so boring being at home I sort of I basically decided I was just gonna say yes if somebody asked me to do something hey can you give me a lesson sure you know for free sure you know can you play on the, my, my video? Can you record on my album? Like, sure, I did so much playing for free. <laughs> but I was happy to. It was something, I, you know, I got to do like all sorts of crazy cool projects. Well, one thing that happened was um, I got asked to play a fanfare 
It's a, the, the, the backstory is that I got asked to play a fanfare in, in the first year, 2020. Uh, that, but it needed to be a nature theme. And I really wanted to do that gig in 2020. But I couldn't find a fanfare that had a nature theme. So I really wanted to do that gig because it was outside of my house. It was not online. I was in the Museum of Nature with this beautiful echoey acoustic. And I really wanted to play there. So I was like, I just decided, you know what? I'm going to write one. I'm not a composer, but like I kept having these sounds in my head. Like as I was looking, I'm like, too bad I couldn't find a piece of chord. It sounded like, dun, 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 you know, whatever. So I wrote this piece that they did a beautiful video of it with nice visual, beautiful, visually very beautiful. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Fanfare for the Backyard Bird Feeder. But because of that, because I said yes to that, where I work, the National Art Center, asked me if I would play, and I they gave me the option of playing a piece that was written already or or a, or write my own because they saw that video from the year before. They asked me to write a piece that opened our season of this year. And I did. And I it, it's really weird that I did because <laughs> I'm not a composer, but maybe I am. I don't know. But it so the the, the interesting thing about this piece, it's not long, and we're going to play the video for you as a closer, um, is that it was celebratory because it was the first concert of the season, and we were so happy to be back at work after the lockdown, but it was also one day after the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So it had this, like, and our music director, Alexander Shelley, he had this inspired vision of that he wanted he said there's something so poignant about a single trumpeter off in the distance so he had me placed in the third balcony and he told me all this and he told me about this is and that it would go seamlessly attack at directly into this very kind of dark unaccompanied acapella choir piece which was also very heavy so i had this like whoa man this is but it kind of gave me this sort of inspiration on, and it's basically you're going to hear it's loosely based on our last post um in canada that the lone trumpet player plays on uh, november 11th remembrance day but also taps from the states because 9 11 happened in the u.s so their taps you know on that they play on memorial day so there's i do some direct quotes and some like I inversions and but also I was thinking well because it's in New York when I go to New York I always listen to jazz I always go to jazz clubs so there's sort of some jazz inspired licks in there anyway so there you go this is a piece I wrote and played and um it was it, it's I, I think it's a perfect example of why we practice fundamentals so that you can have a clean, crisp attack and you can have a good start and you have a round, controlled sound. Um, I, 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 and I'm really, I got, I got lucky that day. It went well. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I did, I, if you've seen me beforehand, I was doing square breathing. Let me tell you, I sure was. Um, but anyway, so I just thought that might be a nice way to end this evening of sharing this this piece that I wrote. And thanks again for watching and listening. And please enjoy this piece. Thank you.